I was born on 2nd May 1947 in the county of Norfolk in England as the third child to my parents who were both teachers. My family was quite well off and even put me in a very prestigious boarding school growing up. While I was there, I actively participated a lot in the arts and long distance running. I was quite good at it, not because I was physically good, but because I had more determination. My early life was filled with love and joy since I was the third and youngest child. So it's safe to say I was a bit pampered. My parents gave me all the freedom I required. That being said, I considered myself extremely lucky for my childhood. Money was very unimportant and what was much more important to me and was a greater gift was the countryside, the seaside, the sand dunes, the freedom. Unfortunately, in 1956, at the early age of 9, I lost my father to prostate cancer, and I was left in complete shambles. Suddenly, it felt like all the responsibilities were mine to bear, that I had to do something worthwhile in my life so I could stand on my own feet. In many ways, this made me who I am today. It taught me all the values I needed to persevere. Not having a father, particularly at that time, was very unusual. I felt different. I was on my own. I can't quite explain it, but I think subconsciously, I felt a need to prove myself. After graduating from school, I moved to London, where I joined the Royal College of Art. Interestingly, the principal noticed me. He even advised that I take up design. It was here that I came across a marvelous architect and designer named Buckminster Fuller. I was in complete awe of his work. The way Buckminster approached design was revolutionary. In fact, many considered his inventions slightly mad, even though he created some of the most elegant domes. Its elegance came not from its styling, but from its engineering, and I latched onto that. Inspired, I knew exactly what to do. I approached creative engineer Jeremy Fry to fund my own design for a theater in London, but he turned me down and instead offered me a job to help manufacture speedboats. At the time, I was completely clueless about the process, but Jeremy pushed me into the deep end. You see, he was a true believer in learning from one's mistakes, and so I was expected of the same. As soon as we perfected the prototype, we started selling 200 boats per year. He taught me that someone doesn't have to grow into a job. If you allow them to make mistakes, they'll learn extremely quickly. He also taught me to mistrust experience. He was far happier to have people working around him who had freshness and an unsullied approach. By the mid-1970s, it was time I wired my own project, an invention purely of my design. So, I decided to work on a new blueprint for a wheelbarrow that featured a large spherical plastic ball as the wheel. This would make it easier to maneuver. The model was an instant success. It was even featured on BBC's Tomorrow's World television program. This opened a gateway for many of my ideas. So for the next invention, I used the concept of the ball and launched the trolley ball, which helped launch boats, and also the wheel boat, which could travel both on land and water. Unfortunately, I was beginning to lose control of the business under the pressure of outside investors, and so I had to sell my concepts against my will. As you can imagine, I was heartbroken and upset. It felt like I was parting with my hard work. Fortunately, this was the stepping stone I needed to my greatest invention. It was around the late 70s when I realized that my vacuum cleaner at home was not working as advertised. Frustrated, I decided to purchase the most expensive vacuum cleaner at the time. Surely there was no way this would have the same issue. Well, I was vacuuming at home one weekend with what I thought was a pretty good machine. And I was really amazed by the lousy suction. So I took the machine apart and discovered the problem. A small amount of dust and the bags and filters were hopelessly clogged. This was a complete scam. There had to be something that could be done. And so, I took matters into my own hands. 
I took apart the vacuum to get a closer look. The problem with a paper bag is that the dust and dirt has to be collected by the bag and the air has to pass through the bag. But of course, the first thing that the dust does is go and gravitate straight towards the little holes. And... With everything in front of me, I knew I could make something better. During the nights, I used to visit a sawmill near my house. You see, I was fascinated by their cyclone technology that gathered dust from the air and filtered it. I wanted to shrink it down and incorporate it into my vacuum machine design. My first prototype was made out of tape and cardboard, and yet it worked better than any vacuum I had bought, which gave me the confidence to perfect it over the next 5,127 prototypes that I built. This process took me nearly 15 years, and I couldn't have done it without the love and support of my wife, Deirdre Heinmarsh. When my first working prototype was ready, I ran to the domestic appliance makers to present my product. The English companies turned it down uh, because it didn't have paper bags. And paper bags are a very lucrative source of income. And although my invention was more valuable for the customer, it had the potential to disrupt the markets and they were not willing to take that risk. I then decided to take an even riskier step. I took loans from the bank of over a million dollars and even put my house on the line to start manufacturing the vacuum myself. I just felt that if I gave it up and did something sensible, I'd always regret it. As a user of vacuum cleaners, it was what I wanted. If the bags and loss of suction really annoyed me, surely they would annoy other people. When it was complete, I decided to approach a new market and approach Japan. I first manufactured my vacuum in bright pink to catch the customer's eye and named it G-Force. There, it sold for a price equivalent of 2,000 pounds. It even got awarded the 1991 International Design Fair Prize in Japan. The first sale I made was a mail order catalog. I sat with the buyer all day. Right at the end, he said, it's an interesting vacuum cleaner, but why should I take a Hoover or an Electrolux out of the catalog to put in yours? I was at my wit's end. I said, because your catalog is boring. He called me cheeky, but said he'd take it. And then another catalog took it because I was in the first one. And then I got into one or two little stores. With the money I made with my sales in Japan, in 1993, I opened a plant in North Wiltshire, the Dyson Limited, and started to work to further improve on my G-Force model. Soon, I came up with the DC-07. So if you were looking for something just like a Dyson, it's going to have to be a Dyson. In 1995, the former British Foreign Secretary, Lord Howe, paid a visit to my factory and he asked me if I was facing any challenges. That's when I explained that I found it difficult to break into the UK market. Upon hearing this, he offered a helping hand and so, through Lord Howe's connections, I got my vacuum into big British stores such as Comet. And soon, with the help of advertisements and the slogan, Say Goodbye to the Bag, it became the biggest selling vacuum cleaner in the country. Over the next few years, Dyson slowly started getting recognition all over the world. In the 2000s, I produced several different categories of appliances and each with a distinctive feature, differentiating it from its competitors to justify its higher price. Some did fail, while others succeeded. Even so, I am emotionally attached to each and every product I manufacture. Today, along with our signature vacuums, Dyson Limited sells hair dryers, bladeless fans, and heaters, etc. Like everyone, we get frustrated by products that don't work properly. As design engineers, we do something about it. We're all about invention and improvement. My name is James Dyson, and I am the founder of Dyson. If you guys like that video, please hit the like button. It does wonders for the YouTube algorithm. Just the research and the editing alone of these type of videos takes us close to 18 hours. So we would really appreciate it if you could check out our Patreon.
for just one dollar a month you can support our work um we produce over like 12 videos per month so that's literally eight cents per video thanks so much guys peace out